Here are six financial lessons that completely changed my life. The first is that money can be anything depending on how you see the world. There is a popular quote by Anis Nin, and I'm going to read this. It says, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. And this quote encapsulates this idea that we see the world through our own personal experiences, our own emotions, our biases. And when we see the world through these types of lenses, we don't actually see the world for what it objectively is. And I think this is really, really true when it comes to money. Well, if I look back over my background, money has always been this cause of stress, anxiety, family feuds and arguments in my household. And we already know from recent studies that our financial habits are formed by the time we hit the age of seven. And so what that means is that if you're in an environment like I was where money is this cause of concern, this cause of arguments in the household, it can form negative money beliefs, money scripts within us. And that's something that I've had to correct over, over the years to know that money is a tool essentially. And with any tool, you can create something good or you can destroy things. It really is about your pick of how you see money and trying to see it for what it is, a tool to create something tangible for the future and opposed to it being a tool that you use to destroy what you already have and your future prospects. The second lesson that I learned, budgeting equals control and freedom. And this is arguably one of my biggest lessons of all time, really. Um, if you've picked up my book, I talk about this extensively. The fact that growing up, because money was so scarce, budgeting for me was this exercise that almost reminded me of my failures, reminded me of the lack of, and constantly being aware that I have to penny pinch, I have to save, I have to cut costs here and there, and I can't afford good things. And as I got more established in life, I started to realize that actually, if I wanted to work towards my goals, so for example, I was homeless once, so buying a property, becoming a property owner, I would have to find a way, a system, to be able to manage my money in a way that I could funnel my money towards those goals. And so for me, it's one of the biggest lessons because it required a reset of what budgeting meant to me. In opposed to being this restrictive tool that tells me that I can I, or can't do something that restricts me on my spending, I now see it as a tool that allows me to point money in the directions that I want it to go towards things that I want it to go to. Holidays, having a good time, investing, buying more property, you know, changing lifestyles, for example. And that subtle reframe is really important. I think, you know, everyone needs to have some kind of budgeting system where you understand what you've got coming in, what you've got going out, where you understand what your essential expenditure is, what your non-essential expenditure is and what disposable income you have so that you can put that into a, a third pot which allows you to build towards your goals in the future. It really is the foundation to everything. It creates more control and gives you the freedom that you need. And one of the things that budgeting also does that is incredible is that it allows you to, to identify the, the red flags. There's a saying in business that, you know, if you're not monitoring it, you can't grow it or you don't know what's going on with it. And that's very, very true. If you're not monitoring your finances, you not, won't know where those red flags are and efficiency in budgeting and finances is really, really important. Earning a lot of money isn't dirty and it isn't evil. And for me, this really came to effect when I was in Canadian War, probably 2014 or so. And I got my first kind of like decent bonus check. And then this bonus check was over 40,000 pounds. My paycheck for, the, for that month was circa 50,000 pounds. And I remember looking at this pay slip in my bank account and I, I just remember thinking to myself, okay, this is exciting, but this is just also crazy. And underneath that, I felt a bit of guilt. I remember my parents arguing over five, 10 quid, what money we did and didn't have and what money was being spent on what and what money wasn't being spent on something. To be sat there with a payment of circa 50,000 pounds in a month, even though I'd worked my socks off for that money, just felt, it felt a bit wrong. And it's crazy because if you're lucky enough to earn really, really well in your career, many people I believe will have that initial kind of 
is this right? This can't be right. Is this, have I done something wrong? Like, is this real? I think everyone has that, but it's very, very easy to become accustomed to those things. And it's important to kind of wrap your head around this because the decisions that you make financially when you're at that level become really, really important. I spent a lot of money on things that I didn't really need. I went out and bought a lot of stuff that I wish that I always had. And if I could go back in the time machine, whilst every lesson is valuable, I would have kind of told myself to slow down and be a bit more intentional because that's what I didn't have. I didn't have any intention around what I was spending money on. I just, I'd never been here before. And so I was just going to enjoy it for what it was for as long as I, as I possibly could. And that's not conducive to building wealth in the future. My philosophy has always been that money is a byproduct of good work. And back then we were doing good work. I worked for a pension house, an investment house that was helping financial advisors, people plan for retirement, have really good retirements with a guaranteed product that was groundbreaking at the time. And this saying by Napoleon Hill, which I'm gonna read right now, it says, it's literally true that you can succeed best and quickest by helping others to succeed. And I generally believe that's what I was doing during my career there. And that's something I continue to do here on YouTube, YouTube helping other people succeed through videos like this that may just, I hope, turn on a light bulb, that you think about things differently and change something that has a wider impact in your life. The difference between good debt and bad debt. And this is a problem that is ripe across our generation right now. And it's something that I've struggled with myself personally for, for 15 years, having, you know, overdraft, credit cards, personal loans, those kind of bad toxic debts that don't do anything to improve your net worth, your lifestyle, or your income. And that's really the definition of good debt. You know, acquiring something that either improves your lifestyle, increases your income, or increases your net worth. Bad debt is the opposite. It doesn't do any of those things, and it's just an, a monthly expense that you have to pay for. And worst of all, you're paying interest on these things as well. And this is something that I think we need to be teaching our kids in school, as you know. I've been part of a campaign with Go Henry. Um, to make financial education compulsory in our primary schools. And just last week, I was invited to 10 Downing Street to submit that uh, campaign and a new piece of research where we've actually gone out to schools to get students of you about what they want to be taught about money. And we submitted that to the government last week. It's one of those things that is really, really fundamentally important. And when you look at the state of the economy right now, just bringing it into the context of where we are in 2024, you know, this is a huge problem. And I just want to read these stats out to you because according to recent data, the average non-mortgage debt per household is around nine to 10,000 pounds. Now this is the breakdown of what that actually looks like. And again, this is just average household. So the average debt for personal loans per household trends around between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds per household. When you look at things like car finance, the average car finance debt per household in the UK is approximately four to five thousand pounds. When it comes to credit cards, the average credit card debt per household in the UK has been reported to be between two thousand and two and a half thousand pounds. So when you combine that, that's where you get to that ten to nine to ten thousand pounds average UK debt. This is a big, big problem. Understanding, you know the decisions that you're making where you're taking on debt. I was that guy who worked in the bank who, you know, would open student credit cards for students going to university for the first time. And all I had to tell them then was make the minimum payment. That's the worst kind of education you can give to someone knowing full well that they're going to want to enjoy Freshers Week. And most of the time, the thousand pound facility that you gave them on the credit card will be gone in that first week or two, having a good time in Freshers Week. And so this has been one of my biggest personal lessons and one that I think a lot of us have not learned, or if we were taught the difference between good and bad debt in school, would make better financial decisions for. And you know, when you, if you've read my book again, I talk about debt, bad debt, toxic debt being a drain on your income. And it's true because whilst you're paying toxic debt, you're paying that monthly interest, you're paying that monthly payment, you're never gonna be able to invest, which is lesson number five for me, investing. And again, this is something that we're not taught in school. Um, and I think the main reason why a lot of people 
aren't investing right now, despite the fact that it is so accessible. You can start to invest now with, with a pound. You can invest as and when you want. You're not constricted like I used to be, where the minimum was 5,000 pounds and you had to have a lump sum that you can invest on a regular basis. Access to the markets has never been easier. But I think a lot of people don't invest because number one, they don't have the funds to be able to do so. And that's come out in some recent research with the likes of Wealthify. And number two, people just don't know how to, although that information is now out there. And things like investment courses like the one that I have take people through all of the basics that you need to know when it comes to taking the first steps, investing and doing it in, in a safe way as possible as a first time investor approaching this. But one thing that I think for me was a revelation, particularly, you know, bearing in mind that I learned about this in my 30s is that, you know, compound interest is real. And this idea that you put money into the markets and just back in, just taking a step back, the fact that you can buy companies that are integral to the way that we live as a species is almost a no brainer. We all have to eat, we all need shelter, we all need food, we all need energy, we all need cars. So investing in these companies that provide those products and services is a no-brainer. Investing in companies that are going to be shaping the products, services, technologies that we need in the future feels like a no-brainer because as those companies grow, your money has the potential to grow alongside them. And when you compound that and see the impact of compound interest over the long term, for example, you know, if you have a look at a regular investment of just 100 pounds per month over a 25 year term and you have you know just an average return of say s p 500 has done about 10 percent roughly per year and you take that number 100 pounds over the course of 25 years turns into 132 thousand pounds actually 132 thousand six hundred and eighty four pounds over that period of time and yes we're not saying that there are no risks when it comes to investing there obviously is but the potential upside is there. And the truth is that unfortunately, you are going to have a better chance, or I should say fortunately, you'll have a better chance of getting better returns over the long term investing than you would in any savings account. And there's a quote by Warren Buffett that I just wanna leave this point on. Warren Buffett once said, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And the sixth and final lesson that I've learned that has changed everything for me is that the biggest tool that I have at my disposal is actually my mind. And this is not just about how you earn money and what money you can earn, because yes, you need to earn more money, particularly in 2024. It feels like you can't rely on one job. You need to have multiple streams of income. And yes, your brain, your mind is important to be able to be creative, to understand what you need to do, to think of strategies, just implementing those, researching them. I'm talking a little bit beyond that. I'm talking about how you make the best decisions and how you train your brain to understand and analyze the situation that you find yourself in so that you can make the best decisions, not based on impulse, but based on logic and based on a structure which is centered around your goals, your aspirations, what you want to achieve. And being dispassionate about whether or not the decision that you're making moves you closer to your goal or doesn't. There's a lot of stuff in behavioral psychology which talks about this and it's really, really fascinating. We underestimate how much we're influenced by our mind, our brain, our psychology, and a lot of the time emotional uh, decisions, especially emotional financial decisions can be detrimental because they're not born from logic. They're born from this emotional trigger, this emotional need to do something. And I talk a lot about intrinsic, extrinsic motivation, so on and so forth, really doing something for yourself, understanding what you want to achieve and making choices alongside that. That has been the biggest, I think, personal development point for me over the past decade or so. It's not perfect right now. Um, I'm still working on it, but being aware of it and being able to look at things dispassionately it can take the fun out of it sometimes and sometimes you do have to let loose sometimes you just can't it's not about making logical decisions all of the time for example if there's something that you really really want you wanted to go purchase this thing logic may tell you well no it's going to move you further to, further away from your goal and close to closer but the point is if that splurge 
motivates you to earn more money, then that's something that is worthwhile doing. And you can only understand the balance of that once you understand yourself, your goals, your aspirations, and your own unique build-up when it comes to your mind. Those have been six lessons that I've learned. I'd love to know what lessons you picked up or which one of those resonates most with you. What are the lessons that you've learned? What are the things that have changed your life? And what do you wish that we were probably taught about in school that we weren't? If you've seen anything that you like, like the budgeting tool in this video, um, I'm gonna link all of that down in the comment section or description below. Catch you later.